Welcome to Pure Wrestling Podcast. I'm Mike. And this is Orlando. And we're on episode 389, 11 away from 400. It's Get crazy. It's some math. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like when we very first started doing the podcast, you had something interesting to say, a number for every single episode. That was kind of like the little shtick you had going. Uh, and I always mocked you for that. And then I, I feel like it's almost getting annoying. I feel like every episode I start with, you know, like, I can't believe how close we are. We've already done 389 episodes. And so it gets old too, but it is kind of crazy to think 389 episodes in. We're still doing this. We're still reselling. Uh, and, you know, things change, but uh, the reality is reselling kind of stays the same. And so, yeah, uh, we're doing something a little different today. We did an update last week. And we're doing an update this week. So our update episodes are definitely our favorite. Those are the flagship episodes. It's where we get to talk about what's going on in our life reselling wise, what's going on in the reselling world. Uh, we get to talk about, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, today we're doing a little bit different, uh, but we've got, you know, another update episode, which is exciting. So, yeah. How's it going, Orlando? What's uh, new with you? Oh, there's there's so much going on. I was going to say, let's start with you and then, you know, we can... I'm not trying to be selfish about the time, but I have a lot to talk about. So basically, uh, which you, you probably do too. You're just gonna talk forever. That's fine. We could do no, that. No, 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 um, no. I want to know what's going on with you. All right. So, um, I said last update episode. One of the things that I was looking forward to uh, was trying some Thursday estate sales, Thursday Friday estate sales, uh, because right. I tend to go on Saturdays. Um, Sometimes Sundays, I don't typically do any reselling on Sundays, but I have occasionally like stopped somewhere. It's typically 99% of the time it's Saturdays for the sourcing. And the problem is, at least in my mind, was I'm missing out because by the time I get to an estate sale, all of the good stuff has already been picked through and there's only going to be, you know, the kind of the leftovers there. But the nice thing is that stuff tends to be on sale. So like 50% off everything. Mm -hmm. So you can get a better deal but you're kind of getting a better deal on the leftovers is, was my, my thought. And after I mentioned that, there was a discussion inside of our Discord where people were kind of talking about that. They were trying to figure out, um, you know, is it better to go to an estate sale on a Thursday, Friday, or a first day estate sale, basically? Or is it better to go on the closeout day when they're, when they're clearancing things out? And I feel like most people kind of landed on the, it's better to go later on. Like people mm -hmm. tend to want way too much money early on Nobody wants to bargain. Uh, they want to, you know, everybody thinks these items are going to sell for top dollar. So they're not really ready to negotiate after they've had the items for a couple of days. They're more willing to offload it. You get the better deals. Uh, the flip side of that is the few people who are like, no, first day is the way to go. Uh, agreed, agreed that typically the, the prices can be way too high on the first day. But when you get the crazy big hauls, it tends to be on that first day so if you can you find what they missed late. yeah i mean you gotta you still have to be early um but but part of the problem is if they're still charging if you go to the day one of an estate sale now if it's run by an estate sale company they tend to have better idea on pricing anyways um the best estate sales i feel like are the family run ones because they're more willing to get rid of stuff but again that's from my experience of going on the last day of an estate sale when they're want wanting to just really move the items Maybe it's not even last day because a lot of them do Sundays as well. It's that middle day. Mm -hmm. um, that first day can be tough for them. But a lot of the people who've had big finds like uh, Tim the Slim, like I think he, he was talking about his big find with the uh, the dolls that came on a first oh, yeah. day estate sale. So there is a lot of benefit to that. So anyways, I decided to go to on Friday to some first day estate sales, but they didn't start until nine o'clock. And there was wow. a storage like complete sell like they were completely getting rid of everything and they had pictures there was a ton of stuff in the pictures there's all these like nascar beer signs and look like some vintage like audio stuff in the corner so i'm like all right i'm gonna check this out because it's on uh it's the same day friday but it's earlier in the morning it starts at eight so i can get there pick through some of those items and then get to the estate sale so I'm already about a half hour after eight. It's like 830 when I, I arrive at this place and nothing is set up yet. There's nobody outside. It says outside sale on it. So I like circle around a couple of times and right as I'm about to leave, door opens up and they're starting to unload stuff. So I get out of my car and they're like, sorry, we're starting late today. 
uh, we're not selling anything until we've taken everything out. And I'm like, you won't, I can't, can I can't look through it? They're like, no, you can't like, we're going to take everything out. You don't get to like, sorry, we're starting late. And so I was kind of frustrated and I was like angry and about ready to just leave on principle, but you know, okay, I'm already here. I'll wait. Mm -hmm. And so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting and it takes them forever, but I'm seeing them bring just tables worth of stuff out. And there's like six people working They're They're bringing things out like pretty quick. Um, and, and there's so much of it and I'm like, okay, there's gotta be some profit here. And so I wait a good 40 minutes because the other place, the estate sale is like 25 minutes away. If I go to that estate sale, by the time I get back, it's like either I'm here or I'm not, you know? And every time I'm thinking about leaving, I'm like, well, I've already waited this long. I might as well stick around. Guess what, Orlando? It was all junk. All of it was just disgusting junk. You you should have just left in the first place. That's well. And that's the hard part is you can always like, armchair quarterback it and say i should have left you know hindsight's always 2020 mm-hmm. um but then but you'd have the regret of like what did i miss out on the FOMO? what if right yeah exactly because you just you never know and and there's this principle in economics it's like the the sunk cost principle and it's tough because a lot of people don't know how to really consider sunk costs let's say you pay something a bunch of money on something and it doesn't work um and then it's going to cost you x amount more to fix it and you're like well i've already spent this much money on it so i might as well spend this much more on it and you get to a point where you keep pouring money into something and it's all sunk costs. You should have just let it go. You can't count what you've already paid. That that payment, it's already gone. It's the same thing with time. There's like a sunk cost with time. So, hey, I already waited here a half hour. So you can say, well, I might as well wait another 15 minutes if I waited here a half hour. But the question is, like, if you just showed up and there was nothing set up, would you wait the 15 minutes? Or So you kind of you can't do base it off of what you've already waited. And I kind of got sucked into that sunk cost fallacy. And I was like, well, I've already been out here for, you know, half hour. I might as well wait another, you know, 10 minutes. And I should have just left, I guess. But again, you never know. And so I never know. That's the thing. Um, And so then I went to, I finally got to the estate sale that I wanted to get to. And the street was so full. I had to drive around the block like four times to find parking. I had to park like two blocks away from this house. There was Orlando, I'm not kidding you. There was probably at least 150 people in this house. It's the worst. We we don't I've, get that as much in San Diego, but it does happen sometimes. It was brutal. I could barely move around. And I, so I'm like gathering stuff. I'm throwing stuff in my car, you know, my bag. I brought my, my Ikea bag. And I'm finding some decently profitable items. But a lot of it was question marks because their pricing, they didn't. It was all over the place. Like some things were priced individually, like plates or something. And some things were kind of priced as a set. And so there was like a handful of things like where my real profit came in. I found like a, a set of like really old brass cups that were like neat from from Germany. And they were potentially profitable if it was the price that they were showing, which was like, I don't know, $25, whatever was for the set and not per per glass, which it was hard to tell because other things were, were priced individually. So there were a few things like that where it's like, I need clarification. I need to know, is this individual pricing or is this for the set? And so I'm, I'm loading up my, my bag. I've got a bunch of stuff and I go to try and find someone to ask. There's nobody to ask. I'm pretty much told you got to wait in line. The line goes through the living room, through the kitchen, out the back door, down the patio, around the corner, around the garage, into another garage, around that corner. Like the line was so long, it would have taken me over an hour to get through the line because they only had two people checking out. So I'm like, forget it. I left all my stuff. So it was really kind of a um, a, a waste of a day. It kind of sucked in that sense. But it it definitely, if that is my going to be my experience, of course, you need to try it more often. You can't do something one time and just assume mm-hmm. that that's going to be your experience all the time. We talked about that with your uh, experience at the bins last time you went to the bins, uh, because that was really kind of the first time you've been to that bins or any bins in a long time. So you kind of have to do it a couple of times. But if if the experience I'm going to get out of Thursday, Friday estate sales, those first day estate sales, is that the competition is so fierce you can't even move in them. There's so many people inside, then it's not going to be worth it. Now, it was spring break, so maybe that had something to do with it. More people were able to go out shopping than normal. So I'm going to have to try another time to see if that's the case. But I'm interested if uh, anybody wants to share in the comments below. Um, what's your experience with first day estate sales? Like are first day estate sales better for you or is it better for you to wait until towards the end when they start slashing those prices? So I'll throw in my two cents here about estate sales uh, before updating. 
at least in San Diego. So first day, worst day to go. So unless you are willing to pay top dollar, I, I just I refuse to go. It is top dollar here. And you can't haggle them. You can't. I mean, there, there's there's like different. <laughs> I keep saying families, but there's <laughs> somebody had said in our discord that there's cartels. But whatever, it, whatever it is, there's there's different groups that run the estates around here. And I know like first day is rough. Now, I do know some of the families. And so since I know them, I can tell them, hey, I'm looking at this item. And, and sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, well, if it doesn't sell on the first day, like I'll put it aside the second day. You can come in and you can buy it, at, you know, at the price we negotiate. So I'm able to do that. So maybe that's an option for people. I do not wait to the end. Generally, at the end, everything is gone, at least here in San Diego. Anything good is gone. You might get lucky. And when I mean the end, our end is usually on a Sunday. Usually it starts Friday. Saturday is a good day because it's the 50 percent off day. And then Sunday is like the 75 percent off day. And by that time, most of the good stuff is gone. So you got to you got you to, gotta, you know, estate sales here are, are they're not as crazy as I've seen on on YouTube. Like I've seen people on social media. I've seen people go to estate sales. Like you said, there's like 100 and so cars and there's like lines that rare, very rarely happens, at least in my experience on a Saturday here, uh, even when I go on Fridays. So hopefully I'm not jinxing anything, but. It hasn't been that bad lately. So, hey, I, I want to talk to you guys uh, about our partner for this podcast. This this podcast is sponsored by Vendu. And why am I talking about Vendu? Well, we've been working with Vendu for a long time, meaning that I've been using Vendu for a while. And and we also had an affiliate link. And and for a while, I kind of moved away and just decided just to focus on eBay. But right now, I got to tell you, it's been brutal. It's been It's been tough. And I need more eyes. Right. And if, if I could find something that can streamline it and make it easy where I'm not spending a ton of time, I'm not having to stress about something selling and going, oh, no, what platform do that sell on? I got to I got to remove it. Well, Vendu does that now. Vendu has, has continually upgraded what they're doing. And so right now uh, they have awesome. You know, you can relist, you can delist it and it'll do it automatically for you. You can either import your eBay listings and then you could put them on Poshmark and Mercari and Grilled and, and Depop and, and various other uh, marketplaces. Or you can just create the listing in Vendu and then you can send it out to all those locations. Then you get more eyes and, you know, you might be like, oh, I don't know about eBay lately. It's been kind of tough. Well, at least now you have the option of having your item on Poshmark. You have your option of putting it on Mercari, on Facebook Marketplace and several other locations. So. If you haven't tried out Vendu or you haven't been to Vendu in a while, you should come back. Sign up below. We have a link below. And use our code, all in caps, pure hustle, and you'll be able to sign up for Vendu and you'll get more eyes on your items, which will hopefully mean more sales and it'll be streamlined. So you're using the best time on every single listing that you create. So check yeah. out Vendu below in the link. Uh, that's right. And, and honestly, it's one of those things where we always talk about adapting and finding ways to be successful and mm -hmm. Uh, cross listing is one of those ways where you can really set yourself apart and make sure that you're um, not just competitive, but you're getting, like you said, those eyes on your items. You're, you're reaching every market you could possibly reach, and it's going to allow you to be successful. So if you're looking for that edge, I think Vindu, Vindu for sure is that edge for you. And I will tell you, <laughs> I'm being real about this because eBay has been all over the place lately, and it would be nice to just have you know, a, a handful of Poshmark sales, handful of Mercari sales, maybe something on Grilled, maybe something on Facebook Marketplace, you know, to kind of fill in those days where eBay feels like it's non-existent. And so Vendu creates that opportunity. So check out our link below and use our code Pure Hustle, all caps. All right. All right was that your entire update? Because I, yeah, I just have fail. I, I just have failure to talk about. Yeah, well, mine looking? was pretty much failure, too. So it's good. It's the <laughs> failure week. <laughs> all right. I got to tell you, I was so excited about whatnot. I was so pumped. I thought, I got this. I'm a pro. I've been reselling for years. You and I have done a whatnot auction that went on for hours. I've done several whatnot on my own. I'm like, what do I need to prep for this? Like, I'm good to go. I got the inventory. I'm ready to go. Well, I should have prepared because... I, I had it going for 10 a.m. on Thursday. And by the way, we're doing another one tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Check out whatnot. And it was amateur hour. It was worse than amateur hour. So I didn't get anything ready because I had a ton of stuff to do with my kids the night before. 
Um, I, the only thing I did is I set out the inventory. I didn't have anything hanging. I didn't have anything listed. I, I, I just, I was like, I can do this. This is easy. I get on whatnot. It's a whole new format since the last time I used it. So I'm trying to figure out people. I love all of you that were willing to hang on to the whatnot stream, even though it was, it must've been terrible to stay on there. Like people were, people were like cheering me on. I felt like I was like, um, uh, Lucas from that football movie in the eighties, the kid that like, you know, he wasn't really a football player, but everybody like cheered him on. I don't know. You call it whatever you can call what, it. Rudy? Rudy, whatever movie. Yeah. Rudy. <laughs> well, there, there's Lucas too. That's another, that's uh-huh. older, but, uh, there's Rudy. that, that's what I felt like. Like people were like cheering me on. And, and so I was like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. And so it was just terrible. Like I had a plan of like 60 items. I think I only got to maybe 20 items in the entire like hour. And I sold only like 15 of them. I, I made $51 in sales. Then I, so people got steals. Somebody got a Patagonia a Cinchilla for like a few bucks. Uh, some other Harley stuff. And it was just terrible. So what did you learn? What was your... What okay, was your what learn? did I learn? All right. So shout out to Wayne, K-Way Shop. Shout out to Fernando from uh, Funky Flips. Uh, on, on Instagram, a good friend of mine that l- used to live local. Now he's moved out of state and they said, Hey, give us a call after, like, I want to help you out. So first thing is like, you know, um, I was able to call Wayne and, and, and Wayne's like, Hey, let me talk to you about doing random pulls. So I learned that on the back end, you can just set up random pulls where you set up a listing and you tell them that you're going to sell like a hundred items or 200 items and you're just going to make them random pulls. So it just creates all the, all the listings. So that what that means is when you do the whatnot, uh, you don't have to have the picture or description or anything. Uh, you got to put something on there like, hi, this is Pure Soul Podcast or whatever in the description. But you're just pulling stuff off the rack. Okay, so I learned that I need to do that. So I did that. It's already set up. Second, I can't be using my photo box. Like the lighting in there was terrible. I'm like holding up shirts to myself and I'm like. Just being really awkward. Like, I don't even know why anybody bought anything from me. Okay. Maybe out of the kindness of their hearts. And so, you know, the lighting was terrible because in the photo box, like it goes in and out. Now, to my credit, that morning, the flooding people, because I'm still dealing with flooding in my home, uh, it's all done, but the floors have been ripped out and they're redoing the flooring. Well, that morning they showed up and I couldn't use the room I was going to use for the, the whatnot. So I had to use my photo box. I was like confined. So, that was bad. The, the third thing. I, I So the second thing was make sure you have an open space with good lighting. Make sure that that lighting doesn't fluctuate too much when you're like showing the item. Third one is I need to have like these uh, little hanger number things that you put on the hangers when you do random pulls. So it's one, two, three. And I kind of started doing that the night before. I got some sticky notes. And I, I was getting sticky notes because I was being cheap. And then I was like, I don't need to do this. I'll be good the next day. Sure enough, that was a fail. And I didn't have anything to display the item. It's just, you know, I my iPad, I didn't upgrade it to the latest version of whatnot. So I, I ended up using my phone to stream and to also upload items. Like the, the whole thing was just it was the worst. It was the, I felt, you know what I felt like was I remember in 2003 when I was fresh out of college and I was teaching and like I knew how to use PowerPoint. Like I was the PowerPoint king. Okay. In 2003. And I remember everybody's like, Orlando, you're so good at this. You're fantastic. And like, I didn't, it was just because I used it. That's all. So I, I try to teach teachers like the most basic of things, like how to insert text, how to do animation. And I'm like, how do they not understand this? I felt like I was one of those teachers. Like I felt like I, I had aged myself out of reselling a lot for that period of time. But luckily I got the advice. I should look a little bit better than amateur hour uh, tomorrow morning. I do have, you know, I got my clothing rack. I got my clothing stand. I have the tags. I have my iPad ready to go. I got better lighting. Should be good. You might need to make like a, a business expense trip where you uh, you actually go out to K-Way shop. Uh, go, go visit Wayne and just help him. Help him out during one of his, uh, during one of his whatnots. And just kind of see, like glean from like, him. Like okay, an internship? How do you, yeah, yeah. How do you set up your, your camera? How do you, cause there's, I mean, there's no shame in that, right? Like that's one of the things that like people do when they sell groups and, and, and stuff is they try and help with that, but there's nothing beats actually seeing somebody do it. Like uh, that's how I learned a lot of the stuff I learned was, uh, just 
being like hanging out with you and watching you like list an item or picking up items at thrift store and like kind of showing me what you're looking for. That helps so much more than just doing it on YouTube. Um, and same thing, like when I learned video, I had a few people who kind of physically showed me on the camera certain things. And then when I would watch things on YouTube, I knew even what to look for. Like, okay, how do I adjust this setting? How do I, and it wasn't just, how do I take good video? Because a lot of times you don't know what you don't know, right? So yeah. if you're not sure, like exactly what even questions you need to ask, um, and, and there is a learning curve, right? Like you're going to have to, I think we're in an interesting position being Pure Hustle Podcast in that we already have a following. We already have a lot of people who've seen a couple of our, our um, you know, whatnot streams. And, you know, some of those were, kind of rough too we didn't quite know what we were doing i mean the packing afterwards was was evidence of that Uh, but but a lot of people they have the normal growing pains like if you start out and you're learning like this is what we tell people with like starting with ebay and starting with just like a handful of items that they picked up at a garage sale or even stuff in their house is learn don't don't try and scale too big too fast like make the mistakes when it's small like oh man i lost money on shipping on this now i know when i list things but you're not going back through and and changing hundreds of listings it's like i've only listed five things and now i know how to adjust it so that i'm not losing money on shipping oh maybe i shouldn't buy my postage at the post office maybe i should use like these labels that i can print off like Mm -hmm. those things you (laughs) learn when when you're first starting out and the hard part is with something like whatnot for you is, uh, and, and even for me is we've been reselling for so long. We've done the podcast. We have this following, and so those growing pains are at a much larger scale. Yeah. You know, like like you've got a lot of people watching. Yeah. It's not like you just have one oh, person so watching while you're trying to figure it out. So, um, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you're willing to, you know, kind of eat the humble pie there of like, oh, that didn't oh, work out did. for me, and to learn from it. Um, but but really, that's what this is about, and what the podcast has always been about is is learning and growing. And neither of us try and uh, make ourselves out to be like the experts to know everything. Uh, we're just good at learning and trying to teach mm-hmm. others what we've learned. And so, yeah, I think that's one of those areas where we have a lot of room to grow, and we might decide that that's not the uh, the avenue we want to go down. Uh, you know, whatnot, anyways. But if it's going to work for us, we're going to have to figure out how to do it well, you know, and that just takes practice and figuring it out and, and imitation, right? Like, like imitate the people who do it well. Watch if you're, if you're listening to us right now and you're like, I want to start whatnot, or I want to do some eBay listings, or I want to do whatever it is, imitate, like don't follow people on social media so that you can say like, Oh, I'm not bringing in the money they're making. I'm not bringing but follow so you can learn from them, like make them your mentor. Mm -hmm. Like I was semi joking about going out there and actually like visiting Wayne. Um, I mean, I'm sure you plan on doing that sometime, maybe this summer. So, I mean, but even if you're listening and you're like, well, Wayne doesn't know me, he's not going to let me come to his house and help him on a whatnot (laughs) sale. You know, like if that's you, you can still watch his whatnots and go, okay, what is he doing? How is he doing this? Like, okay, it looks like he's using a camera like in this angle. This is how he talks to the people who are buying. Here's how he puts the the, the numbered hangers on his stuff. So whether it's him or somebody else, you know, if you, there's a certain item you want to sell on eBay, imitate the things that people are doing well. Don't try and be them, but just learn like, oh, that's a good strategy. I should try and do that. No, I, I agree. I agree. And, you know, part of it, the reason I stuck it out was I wanted to let people know, like, this is what you need to go through. This is kind of, you know, the the process of and I'm glad I failed because I learned how to be better the next time. And I know I'll be better and it's not going to be flawless, but it's going to keep getting better. And I do want to make this a staple of what I do as part of my reselling business. Just like, you know, right now, I you know, lately I've been introducing Vendu. I've been doing cross listing. I also want to continue uh, with with whatnot, because I got to tell you right now, I, I need to sell where I can sell. Right. And that that's my goal. And, uh, you know, I know some of these I'm, I'm I gave away some of the stuff pretty much. Uh, and so it's somebody else's deal. But for me, it's I, I want to move inventory. Right. I, I got items that, you know, I, I picked up. And and here's the thing. I'm so glad that my costs were low. So I wasn't stressed out. You know, when I sold something for five or ten bucks, you know, I didn't pay five or ten bucks. I paid less than that. And so I still ended up profitable. All right. Now, second part. I went to the bins again. Nice. How'd it go? Uh, it wasn't great. It, it still no. was the same. But here's the difference. When I went this time, there was no crowd. Like it was, it was pretty empty. So there is that hope that you know, if you're able to get there at a decent time, like, and you know, you get there early, you can get good stuff. Now, the unfortunate thing with me is my kid, 
has school at the same time that the bins open. So I'm never going to be there around time. Um, I, I did pick up, you know, I picked up a vintage like Nintendo. It was like this uh, motion s- sensor seat. I don't know if you saw that in the discord. Picked it up for like eight bucks. I'm hoping it sells for good money. Uh, and I picked up some other items. I picked up um, a tripod and a baseball glove and all. And, and listen, the bins are worth it if you can find good stuff because it's so cheap. I mean, I, I paid like seven or eight bucks uh, for the stuff that was part of the bins. Where, and if I went to a regular thrift, it would have been like 20 to 30 bucks. So that's great sourcing. I, I was encouraged by the fact that it wasn't crazy. I think people were kind of like they showed up and they're like, yeah, this is not our thing. So that opens up more opportunity to go. Um, I, I think the reason people aren't going is that for whatever reason, the store that shall not be named Goodwill. I don't think they understand that people don't want to be, you know, standing around for three or four hours going over the same bins over and over and over again. If they want to keep things moving, you got to rotate bins like I would say every 30 minutes or at least every start of the hour. But they just weren't doing that. And so I'm going to keep going back. It's it's a short drive after I, I drop off my kid, so it's worth it for me to go, just you know, to hang out for an hour or two. But if I do this like I'm gonna do this for like four or five weeks in a row, and if after four or five weeks in a row I, I find that it's just not worth my time, uh, I'm just gonna stop going. But I, I you know, I I'd like to be able to pick up some inventory. I mean, the the clothing there, you know, you can get great deals on that. You can great deals on on electronics, on toys, but it's just it's just not rotated enough. So. You know, it was better. It was better because it wasn't as crowded, but the the efficiency uh, was not there. And then last of all, I just made it to garage sales and it was nice. I I can tell I was rusty on the negotiation. I kind of didn't want to. So I kind of understand when people are like, I don't like haggling. I don't like getting awkward because I struggled with that, which was weird. Really? I did. Yeah. And you know me, like <laughs> I'm always willing to get a good deal or or you know, position myself in a way to get paid more, or whatever it is. Use it or lose it, right? I know, I know. And so, you know, I, I kind of the, the the first one was tough because there's there's a guy here that he buys storage units and then he sells stuff at his garage sale that he doesn't want to list on eBay or whatever. And uh, he gives you such good deals. We're talking about, you know, I, I was picking up like hats for a dollar a piece, jerseys for a dollar a piece. Some people were picking up video games, and so. Since I had already established that relationship, I kind of was like, you know, I'm not going to haggle you, man. How much do you want? And he's like, you know, 15 for everything. I was like, I right, sold. But that's it. But here, here's why garage sales were a fail. I went to 10 garage sales. Eight of them were resellers. And I'm not mm-hmm. talking about, you know, there's two kinds of resellers at garage sales. There's the ones that they just do. Re- they just do garage sales. Like they don't sell on eBay. They don't. They're like the, the perpetual flea market, like every week. Okay. Then there's the people that actually do resell on eBay and they're just trying to offload or they're trying to get out of the business. Uh, I had those individuals. It wasn't the perpetual flea market. And so it was a ton of resellers. And it's really tough with some resellers because they're still holding on to every dollar. You know, there's something that you could sell for 50 and you're at a garage sale and you're asking how much and they're giving you prices of 10 to 20. And then you try to negotiate with them and they're like, no, I really need 20. And it's like, I kind of want to say, but do you realize this is a garage show? Like you should have just kept your listing on eBay because you're not going to get that money here. But I didn't say anything. I just went about my business. So it's been kind of rough, but you know, it it is what it is. Uh, I've been able to source. I've been sourcing local auctions. That's still been profitable. I've been doing local deals and I still got a lot of inventory that, you know, I still need to process. So it it is what it is. It All right, Mike, do you have- is what it is. <laughs> it is what it- I know a lot of people don't like it like that phrase it's it, it's like you're giving up when you say it is what it is i don't know i mean it, it could be uh you could look at it that way or you could look at it as you're just being realistic and like hey i'm not gonna make a big deal about it this is what it is and i'm just gonna you know almost stoic about it um so yeah um so yeah random stories i don't have anything super crazy but it's interesting so i was at a store I'm almost not sure if i want to give it out i think it was a fluke thing so i'll, I'll use give coded it language no, I'll give it out. So I was at um, a store oh, called Academies. You. We didn't have no gatekeeping. Uh, we didn't That's have kids uh, say. Academies in Southern California, at least not in our area. But it's basically like imagine like a Dick's Sporting Goods, kind of similar to that, a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but that'll give you an idea of like what Academies is. Um, 
so I'm at the academies. I had to pick up some stuff and I'm there with my wife and, and our kids. And I pick up some items that I needed. And as we're leaving, my wife's like looking at various things and my kids love shoes. And so especially like one of them, he's always like trending on shoes and stuff. And so he found the shoe section. So he's like throwing on shoes and I'm laughing about it. And my wife hands me these pair of Crocs, right? I've got them actually right here. And she's like, hey, look these up on. Oh, you can't see them because of the uh, green screen. Are Anyways, they clear? No. Yeah, it's funny, huh? Uh, they're Buzz Lightyear. Uh, so the green on them is because oh, of the green screen. Cool. <laughs> um, so uh, they're Buzz Lightyear Crocs. And she's all, look these up on eBay. And my son was trying on some Crocs. So I thought maybe they just didn't have his size. And I'm like, oh, maybe she wants like like his size of these. Like this, this isn't really his style or our style. Um, and so I look it up and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like these things are selling for like $120 a piece. Right. And she's like, I knew it. So she had seen on social media or something where somebody like freaked out about their husband buying their kids like the Buzz Lightyear and the Woody Crocs. And like, yeah. you know, everyone was like, oh, I can't believe he got some. So she in the back of her head was like, oh, those must be like a special rare thing. So, yeah, sure enough, like if you look them up there, there's a huge demand for them. And there was not even a price tag on these. These were clearly somebody bought them and returned them because hmm. there were none, no other ones in the store. And I'm sure they had these like weeks ago in stock and and somebody bought they didn't even like they haven't been like worn or anything. They just took the tag off of them. Maybe they tried them on and then put them back on the thing and, and brought them back. So they're new, but they don't have the tag for them. Uh, but I was like, holy smokes, like this right here, we're going to probably make like sixty five dollars net profit off of these these Crocs when they sell. And to think like. Just random trip to the store. The fact that my wife had yeah. been paying attention to something she saw and it just so happened that they were right there. So it was just kind of a fluke random thing, but also like encouraging to see like, hey, my wife is like, she's got that killer instinct, you know, like she she noticed, she remembered like, I think these might be worth something because when she told me to look them up on eBay, my mind didn't even go to, oh, maybe this is like these resell. I thought maybe she was just trying to buy a pair. So um, it, it kind of cool. Yeah. Keep your keep your eye out. I don't think you're going to be able to easily find these. They're sold out everywhere. Uh, but they're, uh, they definitely sell for a lot of money. If you can find the Woody, I guess this is a free bolo. If you can find the Woody or Buzz Crocs, they're, uh, they're, there's profit in them. You just killed somebody's market, multiple people markets. Yeah, I don't think so because, uh, it's all people over social media. You know. No, I know, I know, I know. It's always funny though when people say that, like, oh, you're killing the market. It's like, listen, by the time that we've said anything, the market's already dead. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, well, I don't I don't have any random stories, uh, but I do, you know, uh, wanted to share real quick about uh, my reseller genie. Uh, my reseller genie has been really helpful, at least, especially because guess what, Mike, my taxes. Did I mention this before? My taxes have been delayed to October due to flooding. So, you know, my reseller genie was ready to go. I was ready to import everything from eBay and get my taxes done. And now I get a little bit more time. And so I get to go through my reseller genie's profit loss. I get to go through how much shipping costs and all those. And if you're stressed about your taxes and you do not have that extension like I do in San Diego and you're worried about April 15, check out my reseller genie. Use our code Pure Hustle and you'll get 15% off the first month. And uh, I just remember we're supposed to announce the winners. All right, next week we will announce the winners for February. <laughs> uh, and if you want to, this get is our new shtick. We promise to give things away, and then we forget about it. But we still, we still come through, though. We still come through. So, That's right. if you want to be eligible for the March uh, contest, where you, all you have to do is comment, and you get a free month of my reseller genie. Uh, again, if you want to know what my reseller genie is, it's a bookkeeping software for resellers created by resellers. So you know it's legit. You know it's something that will help you. Uh, go to the link below. Use our code Pure Hustle. You get fifteen percent off the first month. And who knows? You leave a comment in the YouTube's, uh, you'll maybe get a free month of. My reseller genie. So check them out. Yeah, Do that on All the right. YouTubes when you're on the interwebs. So uh, <laughs> here's what it's like. We keep forgetting to announce the winners, which is kind of like how some people feel like a gut punch when you forget. Oh, no, it's tax season. Taxes are here, especially if you realize you hadn't been keeping up yet. So my reseller genie, man, it is a game changer. Like I cannot stress enough. Some of you guys, I know you're thinking, oh, it's already March. It's too late for me to start this. It's not too late get on my reseller genie now the earlier you start the better because when you go to do your taxes this time next year i promise you 
you'll be sending us an email saying, thank you. You're right. My reseller genie saved me hours and hours and hours. So uh, definitely sign up for my reseller genie. All right. I'm thinking people now are like, you know what? Enough with the ads. We'd like to hear some hustle of the week. Yeah. Bring hustle in those scores. We love, we love our hustle of the Come week. Come on, hustlers. It's the freaking hustle of the week. Yeah. All right. Our hustle of the week. Our first one comes from Vintage Mermaid, uh, which is one of our OG Discord people. I think like from the beginning, probably close yep. to day one of us releasing the uh, the Discord, Vintage Mermaid was on there. Uh, so this is in my top three favorite finds ever. Not so sure or not sure how much I paid for it as it was a big buy lot or a big lot, uh, but definitely no more than five dollars. I find and pass on a lot of vintage Barbies. The only reason that I chose to purchase this one is because I had seen another vintage vendor post about a similar one in her IG stories about a week prior and she had sold it for around $150. I'm going to make my screen a little bigger. I can't I can't see Orlando. I feel like I'm a uh, you, you mean bifocals. Over. I, I really I might need them. All right, here we go. Um, the main characteristic she had in common was the rooted hair eyelashes. This one was in much worse condition, no clothing and haircut, uh, but I knew she would sell for at least 30 bucks. Plus, this was the African-American version of the Barbie, so I knew that it had to be hard to find. While still shopping, I looked her up. Sold comps, new and packaged, were selling for around 300 I was surprised wow. by the by that, considering that this was from the 1960s. Went home into my death pile. She went. I was finally ready to list her and did some new research. Turns out the ones I had looked up prior were not vintage; they were reproductions, and that's why they were only selling for 300. There were no sold vintage comps because this Barbie is just that rare. To my surprise and delight, it turns out that this is the very first non-white Barbie. And to boot, this is the first release of her. In amazing condition, she's worth around four to five thousand dollars. But even in the condition I had her, she lost. Uh, she sold last week for eight hundred. That is my biggest sell yet. And I just love the historic significance, the fact that it's a vintage toy, uh, which are my favorite things to sell. Ironically, my next highest sale was for a brat doll, which sold for seven hundred and fifty. Apparently, I need to learn my dolls. That's where the real money is at. Yeah. I mean, what a cool story. I mean, it's cool when you have something that's like mm -hmm. a piece of history, yeah. uh, especially when you don't realize what you have, right? You look at something because I feel like there's plenty of times when you look something up, you get excited about comps, then you realize you don't have that version that sells for a lot. Uh, when it happens the other way where you are okay with the comps, but then you realize yours is worth way more than those, that's like, oh, that feeling is great. So fantastic job. Vintage Mermaid on the vintage Barbie find. Nice work there. Nice work. And she's local. So I see her at estate sales every once in a while or garage sales. So I uh, hope we'll run in, uh, into each other again. All right. This comes from Michael at simply savvy deals on Instagram. Emailed us actually and said, Hey guys, been listening to you regularly for about a year. Thanks for all the great information you provide. I finally have a hustle to share visiting Goodwill outlet in Nashville, getting ready to leave when a new bin came out. See, New bin. You hear that? You hear that, San Diego Goodwill? New bin. Okay. Couldn't resist taking one last look and found a Pro Elite catcher's bin. Oh, those are great. Uh, added it to my finds and checked out with the total bill of $88. So obviously, they picked up a ton of other stuff besides the mitt. Uh, located a play against sports store within a few miles and was able to trade the catcher's mitt for $68, making my total out of pocket for the trip $20. And there's a Bose remote in my bins hall that will bring at least $30. Always nice to restock for free. Thanks again, guys. Uh, Michael has simply savvy deals. And that's a win all around. Multiple reasons. One, you know, it, it, it took care of your cost. A second, I always love it when people do this. I wish I could do this more often, where they just went to play it against sports and made that instant money, right? Could it have gotten maybe close to 100 on eBay? Sure. But that's cash in hand within minutes of you picking it up. Uh, there, there's a lot of resellers that do that. And I, I wish I was more prone to do that. I just automatically go, I got to list this on eBay. So nice work there, uh, Michael. And uh, hopefully you keep getting new bins at your Nashville Goodwill. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny how we kind of lost that. I remember like being a kid, like you'd get, you know, when I was collecting Pokemon cards or even like football cards and stuff, 
you'd, you'd buy the pack, you'd get something good and you would either trade with your friends or you'd go into the, the store that sells those type of cards and you'd make trades, or you'd sell it to them and you'd buy new cards. And you kind of forget that like you can do that local kind of trade, you know, where you buy something and then you go into another store and you flip that item you just bought. So yeah, that's great. <clears throat> All right, our next one uh, comes from Sam, and this was an email. It says, hi, guys. I recently saw a Facebook Marketplace post for 17 guitar pedals and accessories. I knew nothing about them, but messaged the seller asking how much for everything uh, while starting to look at comps on eBay. We agreed to $800. Okay, this is me talking now. Whoa, that's a pretty big deal to like go from you're not sure anything about this to willing <laughs> to spend $800. That's it's impressive. So I picked up the items right away before someone else could swoop in. In less than two weeks, I've sold eight pedals and made all of that 800 back already and still have $1,500 in listings up. I should be able to easily clear $1,000 in net profit on this one pickup. Bundle pricing check, quick negotiation and decision making check, learning a new niche on the fly check, hustle of the week check. Fantastic job, Sam. Um, I, yeah, I think that's great. Like again being willing to take a risk like that um shows that you've got the you've got what it takes you you know how to take something you don't know about but do quick research figure it out quickly do the negotiation and get it done um that that is what that's like the epitome of a hustle of the week so fantastic job yeah the quick decision i mean you're you're taking a risk right but you saw that the risk was worth it that's the beauty of technology maybe he did a google lens search maybe he was able to look up some comps. I mean, but you got to think quick on those deals because they could, especially guitar pedals. Uh, I haven't picked sourcing guitar pedals probably in like four or five years. And the last one I had, I picked up like 20 of them for like 80 bucks. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy, but it was, it was an easy risk for me for 80 bucks. I think I made like a thousand on those. So nice work there. Uh, Sam, appreciate you emailing us at the Hustle Week. So Mike, I saw that you've been really busy. So no Hustle of the Week this go around. Uh, so I'll just jump into mine. So I had mentioned uh, the art hall that I had in, in La Jolla, I don't know, a few months ago. And what I've realized is that lately I've had these big halls at these very nice establishments. I've been picking up artwork and, you know, like, you know, ancient, like not ancient, but like antique trinket and stuff. And that stuff does not move. It may be worth money, but not in this economy. People are not looking. Well, finally, two of the pieces of art, uh, that I had uh, one was like a w watercolor print of like Kansas Jayhawks, you know, from college basketball and, and a Hawaiian shirt. Another one was a Superman Hawaiian shirt. And now these are prints. They're not the shirts themselves, but they're, you know, painted on there. And it's a uh, boy from crypto. It's uh, basically Superman. OK. And somebody reached out to me and they sent out an offer for one of them for two hundred and twenty five dollars. And this, I was looking at auctions, like when things were really good back in 2020, 2021, they were selling for about 800 bucks. So at that time, I had a dilemma when the offer came through. I'm like, do, do I accept this? Do I counter? I'm like, listen, I've had this for six months. Uh, who knows when things are going to rebound in the economy where I can two exit or three exit. I'm just going to accept it. Just let it go. I mean, I paid $250 for everything I picked up that day. Right. So I already made money. I already sold like some charms that I picked up. I already uh, sold some art books that I got. So I already was in the profit. So I sold the first one. Then they messaged me and, and they were they were sly. They, they, they knew how to get those bargains. So they're like, hey, I saw that other painting that you had. And, and you know, by the way, these aren't watercolors. These are actually prints. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Blah, blah. They knew what they were looking for. And then they told me they knew like they knew the author, the, the painter that the painter had passed away. In the late 90s and this is these artworks are very famous to kansas and so i was like all right you know what if they make a deal with me i'm gonna sell it to them because it's gonna go to a good home like i, I don't you know the worst is when you make a deal for someone and you know it's just somebody's gonna flip it i mean i don't mind doing that you know i what? do that all the time wait 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 what, what? i mean after last week's story come on come on but nobody How was nobody was no but there's no contest for these okay so they said, how about, would you be willing to sell the uh, other one, the Superman one for 125 And I was like, 125 Okay, that's because I'm thinking about the packing. So to give you guys an idea, when you have artwork like that's framed, 
you need to bubble wrap it. Then you need to wrap it in cardboard. And then you have to float that box in another box to arrive safely. Okay. And that takes some time. I mean, these, these things were like four feet by like two feet. It wasn't not four feet, maybe three and a half feet or whatever. Uh, but they took some time to pack. And so I was thinking about that, like 125. Yeah, it's good money. But is my time worth like the hour that I'm going to spend packing this? So I said, hey, listen, I appreciate the offer. I, I got to be because they knew they knew I got to sell it. So they said, hey, I know you want to move these, you know, at 125. And I said, listen, I appreciate the offer, but I, I got to be at 225. Like, that's my lowest number. And they're like, you know what? That's awesome. Yeah, let's do that. And I'm like, and then after I said that, I'm like, wait a second. They 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 had that number already in mind. They just were looking to see if they could get it for a hundred dollars cheaper. So they and were they, they, they did they did what we talk about, right? Like the good negotiation Correct. skills they use. Correct. You know, if you can't if you have to give the first well, I mean you obviously gave the first number, but if you've got to give like the next number, you can anchor them really low, right? That's always a super useful tool. You know, you don't go so low that it's ridiculous and you just get blocked but go low enough. And then you went higher, which they were happy with. But again, like if they had said we could do anywhere from 125 to 225, you'd have been like, okay, 225, right? Like you, you become happy with that when that was the number. If they would have came in originally with 225, you might've been like, well, how about, you know? So yeah, that low anchor, man, that what a, what a powerful tool that is negotiation. Yeah. They did a great job. So I can't complain though. You know, I spent 250 for everything there. I already was in the profit, and then I sold both of these together for four hundred fifty dollars plus shipping. Uh, it took me about two to three hours to package them because I wanted, you know, the worst would be if it showed up and there's like shattered glass and and these are artworks, you know, and and they get damaged and they arrive safely. I got great feedback on them; it all worked out, and, and they were grateful. And I, I I'm thinking about reaching out to them because I have one more piece of art from this painter, and so maybe they'll buy that last piece. So we'll see what happens. So, anyways, that is. My hustle of the week. Yeah. All right. Hey, if you guys are wondering, you know, you're like, hey, Orlando, how, how do people email you guys? Hey, Orlando, you guys mentioned the Discord. Uh, easiest way, number one, to get on the Discord is we have a Patreon uh, that allows us to continue the podcast. So if you haven't signed up for five fifty five a month, uh, you can help us out. And that gives you entrance to the Discord, a thriving community, a pure hustle. Uh, resellers that are there uh, and so check out the link below or go to patreon.com slash pure hustle podcast and we'll be there for 555 a month if you want to email us you can always email us at pure podcast at gmail.com or you can call us and leave a voicemail 619-738-1170 and uh, just great for all of you that follow us on social media we're pure hustle podcast on all social and we are pure hustle cast on twitter and uh, if you haven't yet in this episode make sure to subscribe Make sure to smash that like button and hit that bell notification so you're notified whenever we go live because we go live on Mondays. Sometimes we're not perfectly on time because life gets busy, but we do go live. And th those live ones have been really cool. Um, I've really they enjoyed being being able to uh, to kind of interact with people while we're talking because it actually influences the podcast. Like it, that mm -hmm. is one of the most like interesting aspects of new media if you think about it like it's interesting that people can listen to me and you have conversations about our reselling and they get to be part of it in that sense i mean i remember always listening to podcasts you know about various things i was interested in and you feel like you're part of of like a conversation even though you're not necessarily part of that conversation uh, but yeah the live aspect um if you haven't come over to youtube yet and hit the subscribe and that that bell notification you're missing out because it is really really cool now Orlando and I aren't anything special, uh, so I don't want to put it that way. But it, it's interesting because I, I was like fanboying over uh, this podcast that I'm like, I, I follow pretty religiously. Like I, I listen to these guys all the time and they were live and I actually like commented on the comment and they put my comment up on the screen and they like were talking back to me. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, like, I'm like interacting with the podcast. Like it felt super cool. Um, and, and, you know, that was Are you saying fanboying. that's how people feel when we put their comments up. I started this part by saying Orlando and I are I anything special. I know, I know. I, I'm not, I don't want to say that, but it is, it was interesting to, to see what it was like to actually influence another podcast. And like what I said changed what they were talking about. And, and, and to think like, that's how I feel too. When we're on the podcast, we're doing a, a live on YouTube and we have people in our comments saying things and it's, it, it, it changes. It's like, you really are part of the conversation and, well, Lana and I actually have some of the best conversations when other people are are, are chiming in and they've got 
good input that we might be missing. Uh, it allows us to like live because a lot of times Orlando and I will have uh, disagreements in which Mike is always right on. Uh, but we okay. say things like, let us know in the comments below what you yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we kind of hope maybe at some point somebody will mention whether or not they agree with me um, uh, or if they wrongly side with Orlando. But when we're live, like people will, like live time, like correct us and be like, oh, actually, I disagree. And it's like kind of cool because we get that instant feedback of, you know what? I hadn't thought about it that way. So, um, yeah, make sure you're coming over to those lives and let us know when you're on those comments um, or if you're sending us an email or you've joined the discord what are some topics you want us to talk about? What are some things you want us to talk about? Because, um, you know, we have been doing this this podcast now for 389 episodes. Um, and it's not that we run out of things to say because reselling constantly, there's new stories, there's new things we're doing. But we want uh, a feel of the pulse from you guys too. So what is it you want to hear? Let us know in those comments. Send us those emails. We'd love some more voicemails. And it really does um, make this work. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And... And also it helps us out because, you know, our experience in reselling may not be your experience in reselling. And so you may have things that you'd like us to discuss. Uh, so, for example, I'm just going to throw it out there. Like our negotiation podcast was our lowest performing one in a long time. And that used to be one of our highest performing ones. And I guess people are just done with hearing pre podcasts talk about negotiations. And so if there's something more, let us know. Because, again, we're not gurus, but we do have some experience. Uh, and we'd like to share our experiences with you. All right. What are you looking forward to, Mike, here as, as we move, continue in this journey of reselling? All right. So this one is um, interesting because, I mean, I could obviously talk about I'm looking forward to more garage sales. I can talk about looking forward to the listings and making my store move more and all of those things. But um, it's really cool seeing my son. Um, he hasn't really got into the reselling thing yet because he's still a little young. He's six, okay. getting close to seven now. He's like six and a half, but man, he has the entrepreneurial spirit that like I had when I was his age. So he's always wanting to sell things, always wanting to figure out a new chore to make money. And we've been trying to teach him to read. We've been going through this reading program with him and he's doing really well. Um, and we've kind of had like this, you know, carrot for him, this thing that he's been trying to achieve. And what we were doing is for each lesson that he completed, we were putting a dollar in this jar and he got to, when he finished his hundred lessons, he was going to be able to spend that hundred dollars. Well, he's got toys, right? Like reselling has allowed me to get tons of toys. I wouldn't normally buy for him. And, you know, we spoil our kids. Unfortunately, we probably shouldn't spoil them as much as we do. Um, so we're like, what is he going to spend his money on? He loves having money. So we, we also saw he was interested in chickens. Right. Like he would talk about chickens. He had a, a neighbor who had some chickens. And so we kind of found a way to like bleed the two interests that he has. He's always trying to make money and he's really likes his idea of chicken. So what we did is we allowed him to save up, save up to get the stuff that he needed to get some chickens right now. I don't know if you could hear them. Um, hopefully not in my garage. I've got uh, five uh, chicks. that are like a couple weeks old now at this point. And it's going to be a while before he's, got chickens coming out or uh, chi uh, eggs coming out, <laughs> but he has already been soliciting people to buy eggs. Like he's found people who are like, when you have eggs, like we'll buy them at this amount per, uh, nice. per dozen. And the cool thing is with that, like I, I get to teach him, okay, like if you sell your eggs, here's how much money you're going to make, but you have to buy food for the chickens. Right. So here's now your expenses to make the, those eggs. And so I guess what I'm what I'm getting at with all of this, the this almost random chicken story is I'm excited to see my son learn business. And the fact mm -hmm. that I I wanted to sell lots of things when I was his age, I sold candy. I made candy at home He's like, you know, sucker rock candy type stuff. And I'd sell those. So I knew how to like make money. But it wasn't until a little bit later in life that I really started to learn like, okay, what's, what are expenses and how do you know for sure? And how do you like, how can you deal with your margins and how do you make more? And how do you negotiate a better price? And all of that kind of came with time. And reselling has been one of those things that has really dialed it in for me and helped me to really kind of hone that craft. And I'm excited to teach those things to my son. I'm excited for him to learn what is it like, how much does this cost me per egg? Like how much am I spending of this money that I'm making on chicken food and yeah. how much time do I have to spend going out there and watering them and all of that. So when I do end up selling a dozen eggs, am I making money and how much money is going in the jar? And so for him to learn that and for me to be able to kind of use 
the stuff that I've learned to teach him at such a young age how to put his work and his effort into something that could actually benefit, um, learn to like counting, like his counting recently has been a lot to do with money. And so just learning how I can take things that I've learned in reselling, pass that on to my kid with skills that whether or not he ends up selling stuff on eBay, these are skills that he's going to be able to take with him for the rest of his life. So I'm really excited to see how maybe every time we go places, us talking about things we could sell and how much money we can make is what has kind of influenced that like desire for him to make more money. Uh, but just to see how um, this is rubbing off on my kid, it's pretty cool. And uh, I, I, awesome. I'm excited for some chickens too. There you go. <laughs> well, I don't have a great story like yours. Uh, of course, I'm looking forward to the one not tomorrow. So if you haven't yet, uh, make sure to, you know, check out Orlando. Hopefully not look like an amateur tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, I'm also uh, realizing that, you know, garage sales need to pick up. So I'm looking forward to garage sales, which is the normal thing. But here's one thing that really has been bothering me lately. As I've been reorganizing because of the flooding, I've had to move inventory and stuff. I have a lot of junk. And I think part of the reason that my sales haven't been spectacular is just because I think there's a lot of poor inventory that's weighing down my store. Or let's say I'm getting like 10 sales or 20 sales a day or 30 sales a day, but they're just not very profitable items. You know, it's like a $20 here, $10 here, $30 here. And I know that's what people are buying, but I'm just like, why did I even list this? And I think part of it was that <clears throat> during the era of 2020, when pretty much anything was selling, I listed anything, like pretty much everything I sourced instead of, you know, deciding that someone's going to go to donate, some items were going to go to the trash, some items I was going to list. I just listed all of it. And now I look at my store and I'm like, I'm embarrassed at some of the stuff. I'm like, what? What? Why is this? Why? Why did I list this? There's sell through rate on this is terrible, which didn't exist back then. Well, it did exist, but no one really cared about sell through rate back then. Uh, at the same time, it's like how many people are actually looking to buy this item? So I, I'm going to have to make some decisions here. I, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I don't know. Some people have suggested to me to do a uh, like instead of doing the automatic 55 percent off everything, maybe do 30 percent off, you know, new things. And then as time passes, make it go to whatever, 40 percent and 60 percent uh, Thriftzilla. Remember one of our kind original like listeners? Tiered. Yeah. Was that? Yeah, like a tiered. I was going to say like a, like a tiered program as far as uh, uh how to how to put things on sale. Yeah, I think that's smart. Yeah, I mean, he suggested he's our he was our first hustle of the week, do you remember? Way back when. And it was an awkward conversation cuz we're like, "Hey, we're a brand new podcast. Would you like to share your hustle like as a hustle of the week?" And I I just remember the how awkward. Now, now it's like Hey, you know, if people know what we do, but anyways, takes me back to that. So I, I got to figure out something because I, I really I'm trying to, I, I guess, source cleaner. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just feel like I have a lot of junk uh, from the early days that I just need to offload. So I got to figure out what to do with that. That's not going to be on the whatnot, by the way. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm talking about a lot of the stuff is just hard good stuff that I listed. I'm like, why, why do I even have this here? So. Hey, thank you to all of you that joined us in this hybrid episode from updating you to Hustle of the Week to just sharing, you know, everything that's going on with Mike and I appreciate every single one of you. And if you're listening to the podcast and you haven't jumped over to YouTube, make sure to jump over to hit YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And uh, if you could all leave us an iTunes review, that's always appreciated. With that being said, make sure to be real and be relevant and be reselling. Peace. Peace.